Well, I want you to imagine with me for just a moment. Imagine that today God comes to you. He comes to you. And he says, hey, ask me for whatever you want. So God of the universe comes to you and says, ask me for whatever you want. I mean, that'd be a crazy moment, right? But what would you say? What would you say if God said something like that to you? You know, this is that time of year where a lot of us naturally start to think about things that we want to see different in our lives. Maybe you've got like 15 resolutions that you've got for this year. Maybe you've already failed on your resolution. Uh, or uh, maybe you're like, look, I'm burned out on resolutions. My resolution is to not have resolutions this year. Like, you know, wherever you're at. Uh, but this is that time of year we naturally start to think about things that we would like to see different in our lives. Uh, maybe you want to manage your finances better. Maybe you want to manage your time better. Maybe you want to, you know, do more with your relationships and be more intentional that way. Maybe you're like me and you want to lose a few pounds or, you know, maybe you want to think about, hey, I want to go back and get some more education or whatever it might be. There might be something in your life that you want to see different. So imagine God shows up and says, ask me for whatever you want. Would you say, hey, God, just help me fulfill one of my resolutions. Just take 20 pounds off. That would be awesome. Or maybe better yet, you'd say, God, all my favorite foods, if they could just somehow be calorie and fat free and still taste amazing. And, you know, just, just, God, just do that. That would be awesome. Or maybe you're saying, God, if you could just take the Packers to the Super Bowl and have them win, oh, Lord, I would just love you. And, or, you know, or, or, or maybe, maybe if God said that to you, you'd say, you know what, God, I, I'd like money. And how much would you ask for then? A million? Ten million? A billion? A trillion? How much would you ask for? And then maybe God says, yeah, I'll give you that money. Then wouldn't you be like, oh, man, I should have asked for more. Um, or maybe you say, no, you know what? I'm not so worried about money, but I, I would like better health. So God, give me better health. Or maybe even say, God, give me perfect health. Or, or maybe, maybe you'd say, you know what, God? Uh, actually, I just want a bigger house, more fame, more power, better relationships, uh, God, I just want to know the future. I mean, there could be all sorts of things that we decide, God, this is what I would ask you for. So I want you to actually think about that. What would you ask God for if he said you could ask for anything? Now, I know this seems like kind of a crazy idea or situation, but I want you to understand that this actually happened to somebody. See, there was, God came to a man named Solomon, and Solomon was King David's son, and God comes to him in a dream and he says, ask me for whatever you want. And this is right as Solomon is becoming king over Israel. And you, do you know what Solomon asked for? Do you think he asked for power or wealth or influence? No. He asked God for a discerning heart. What Solomon wanted was wisdom. Wisdom to know how to live life well. Wisdom to know how to govern well. See, Solomon understood something. He understood that wisdom is the gateway to all these other things that we actually want in our lives. You want money in your life? You want wealth? Well, wisdom will tell you how to manage that wealth. Uh, do, do you want more influence or power in your life? Well, wisdom will tell you what to do with that influence or power, how to actually use it effectively. You want better relationships in your life? Well, wisdom is going to show you how to handle relationships that you have in your life and, and how to lean into the ones that are really good and maybe how to set up strong boundaries to the ones that are not so healthy. Do you, do you, do you want to find purpose in your life? Well, wisdom will show you the way. Maybe you want to be a better spouse, a better parent, a better sibling, a better friend, a better employee, a, a better leader, a better citizen, a better person. Well, wisdom is going to help you get there. See, Solomon understood that if you, if you really want to have a life filled with purpose, if you really want all these other things in your life, well, then wisdom is the way to get there. And so he asked for wisdom. And God gives Solomon wisdom. But then he says, Solomon, because what you asked for was wisdom, I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you influence. So much so that the other royal kings and queens throughout the world, they're going to come to you, Solomon, for wisdom. And they do. They come to Solomon's court to, to learn about wisdom. Because, see, Solomon understood that wisdom is the gateway into everything we want in life. Wisdom's the gateway to all these other things that we actually want in our lives. So this is why we're doing this series that we're calling Foolproof. And we're going to be studying through the book of Proverbs. And I'm excited to be back together with everybody, getting back in God's word. I mean, the thing is, I feel like I haven't seen most of you since last year. 
Come on. That was, yeah. That, see, I can only make that joke once a year, and I'm going to do it every time. So it's just, it's just the way it is. I can't not. So, but seriously, we want, we want you to know what it means to live a foolproof life as we go into 2024. Uh, we, we want you to understand wisdom. Because, see, our mission here is to make disciples of Jesus. The vision we have for your life is that you would be someone who knows what it means to follow, to be changed by, and to be committed to the mission of Jesus. Essentially, what we mean by that is we want you to live the life that God has called you to live, that he has a part for you to play in his story. We want you to know what that looks like. And so to do that, you have to become a disciple of Jesus who follows the ways of Jesus. We believe that that also requires that you would understand the wisdom of God and live by the wisdom of God. And so that's why we want to study the book of Proverbs. And really, uh, the book of Proverbs, it's just this great practical guide for us to, to look at together. And it's going to help us to learn how to avoid foolishness. It's going to help us to know how to grab a hold of wisdom. We're going to look at all of that throughout this series. But today what I want to talk about is the value of wisdom and how we can find wisdom in our lives. Now, why would we pick the book of Proverbs? Why is this book so special? Well, the book of Proverbs is actually part of the wisdom literature of the Bible. So that's going to be Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. But Proverbs is by far the most practical out of all three of those. It's a brass tacks how-to guide to living. How, How to live in God's world in God's ways. And this is written by King Solomon to his son. And so this is like a a father trying to tell his son, son, this is how you you live life. So, So that's another way to say it. Proverbs teaches us how to live life. The book of Proverbs teaches us how to live life. It's as simple as that. Because that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is all about knowing how to live life. How to apply the knowledge that we have. And, and we have a lot of knowledge. Well, we were actually considered the most knowledgeable generation who's ever lived as far as data is concerned. See, when I grew up, uh, if you wanted to know something, you would have to go to this set of books called an encyclopedia. Uh, now, some of you can maybe go to a museum someday and see one of these things. But from A to Z, it would tell you all these different topics. It'd take up like a whole bookshelf. And so you'd, you'd have to go in and you'd have to go, okay, like today we, we have a question about egrets. So we're going to pick the E. We're going to look at it. We're going to try to find out. But then you look in an encyclopedia and it still might not have the information that you want. So then you'd have to trek over to a building that's called a library. Now, I know these still exist, but, but you have to understand you'd go to this library and that's where all the information is going to be found. And then you actually have to talk to a real person called a librarian. And you have to talk to them and tell them what book you're looking for. And then you might even have to go to the card catalog using the Dewey Decimal System. And then you'd have to like just wander around the library for an hour. And then you finally find the book you're looking for. And you might have to grab three or four more books because you're trying to find an answer to something. And you might read through those books and still not find the information you were looking for. I believe, for most of my childhood, I believed that if you swallowed gum, it stayed in your system for seven years. How many other of you actually believe that growing up? Yeah, yeah, see, it, it infected entire generations. And now, now at 2 a.m., you can find out that that myth is debunked in two seconds. You look it up on Google, you're like, oh, okay, whatever. And, uh, and you just move on with your life. No, back then, we had to search for knowledge. But now... We have knowledge at our fingertips, more information, more knowledge, more data than any generation that's ever lived. So on paper, we are the most knowledgeable generation ever. And yet, you look around and a lot of people feel like their lives are a wreck. There's a lot of people who just, they, 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 feel, they feel like they're not happy people. They feel like they're anxious. That there's many of us who feel like we have relationships in our lives that are in tatters. A lot of us feel like uh, we have just no handle on our time management, that life is chaotic and out of control. Many of us feel over leveraged. There's just debt in our lives and too many bills to pay, not enough finances. We feel stressed out. We feel worried. We feel concerned. And many of us have trouble sleeping at night. And so knowledge, knowledge isn't enough. We need something more. A great preacher of the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon, said it this way. Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There's no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. 
But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. Yeah, praise God. Knowledge cannot just be what we're after. We have to be after wisdom. We have to want to grab a hold of wisdom. And so that's what we want to do throughout this series. We want to look at the book of Proverbs and we want to just see what the wisdom of God looks like. And again, you have to remember Solomon, wisest man who ever lived. God gave him his wisdom and then Solomon put it down on the page with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so why would we not want to delve into that resource? Why would we not want to just look at the wisdom of God put down on the page and say, God, what is it that I need to learn from the book of Proverbs? And so that's what we're going to do together over the next few weeks. And Solomon, uh, throughout the first few chapters of Proverbs, he actually, he describes wisdom in a very interesting way. See, Solomon wants us to to feel the tangibility of wisdom. And so he he actually makes wisdom a, a character in the human story. He personifies wisdom. And so what I want to do is I want to go to the book of Proverbs. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me. Proverbs is going to be near the middle of your Bible. And I want to look at chapter 8. And so we're going to jump to chapter 8. So Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1. It's also going to be on the screens if you don't have a Bible with you. But Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1. And let's see what the word of the Lord says to us today. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city, at the entrance, she cries aloud, To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They're upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies. And nothing you desire can compare with her. So, Solomon paints wisdom as this woman standing in the streets calling out to us. Now, many biblical scholars and theologians, they refer to this character in Proverbs as Lady Wisdom. And so Lady Wisdom, uh, later on, she says a few verses later that she's actually the first of God's creations. That before God created the earth, he created wisdom. And then through wisdom, he, he created everything. And so there's this interesting idea that wisdom is like the, the, the invisible force that brings order to the chaos of the cosmos. An interesting idea. Then she goes on to say, and by me, kings govern and rule. So she's essentially saying if there's a ruler in in a country or in a company or in a place, and they don't use wisdom to help them rule effectively, then they're not going to be a very good leader. And so that's the claim that she makes. And then I love who she says she's talking to. Different groups of people she addresses in this passage is the simple, the foolish, the discerning, those who understand what is upright. Essentially, what she's saying is, I'm talking to all y'all. I'm talking to everybody. So whether you see yourself as foolish or wise, rich or poor, young or old, male or female, she is saying, I am talking to you. Wisdom is calling out to you. And I love that she says, I'm not hiding somewhere. She's not at the top of some mountain, sitting next to some guru at the end of some weird vision quest. No, 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 where does she say she is? She says, I'm right here on the street. I'm right here in the the daily business of your life, and I'm calling out to you. I want you to pay attention to me. She's saying, look, wisdom's available to you. I'm right here. If you just listen for my voice, you'd hear that I'm calling out to you. I'm right here every day just trying to get you to follow the way of wisdom. And so wisdom is calling out to us. And then she says, there's nothing that can compare with her. She's better than silver, gold, or rubies. Better than wealth. So you could take the wealth of Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Taylor Swift, and you can put it all together, and it's not going to compare with wisdom. You could take all the luxury watches and cars and private you know, jets and yachts and mansions and you could put them all together and it's still not going to compare to the value that wisdom can have in your life. 
There's nothing that you can desire that could be compared with wisdom. Because as we've already said, wisdom is the gateway to everything we actually truly want in this life. Now, now Solomon uses this poetic device throughout different parts of Proverbs. You see in actually chapters 1 through 9, uh, in chapter 1, this is how Pro- Proverbs really opens. He introduces this wisdom, th- this lady wisdom character. But then you see in Proverbs chapter 9, there's another character who's calling out for us. And many theologians refer to her as Madam Folly. So foolishness calls out to us too. Foolishness is also saying, come this way, come follow me, and foolishness will lead you right into a trap. Now you got to remember, Solomon is writing this letter uh, as a, kind of a, an encouragement, but also a warning to his own son. And so he's saying, son, I need you to understand that wisdom's going to call out for you, and I want you to listen for her voice, but folly's going to call out for you too. And so the choice is clear. You either must choose folly or choose wisdom. And if you want to live the life that God's really called you to live, I need you to choose wisdom. And so we want to choose wisdom, which means we have to find wisdom. We have to know where to look for wisdom. So where is wisdom? Where does it begin? Where does it start? How do we start on the pathway of wisdom? Well, Solomon tells us exactly where wisdom can be found, where wisdom begins. And so in Proverbs chapter 9, he tells us this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We don't talk about the fear of the Lord a lot these days. But it's such an important thing for us to understand if we're going to truly know what it means to follow God and to know God. If we want wisdom in our life, we have to understand this. Essentially, if we want to understand how the world and the universe works, if we want to understand how how our own heart works, what it means to be human, uh, what it means to live in this world, then we have to know God and we have to know his ways. So what actually is the fear of the Lord? Is it being scared and terrified of God? See, see there are many passages where someone gets confronted with the holiness of God, and often what happens is they fall flat on their face. Like like John, the beloved disciple. I mean, this is Jesus' boy. Uh, He and Jesus are tight. And yet when John has the revelation in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus comes to him in a glorified state filled with the holiness of God, and and it says that he fell like a dead man before Jesus, his best friend. But do you know what Jesus says to John in that moment? He says, John, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So what we have to understand is that though we are called to fear God, we are not called to be afraid of God. Because he gives us his mercy and his grace, his promises to those of us who believe. And and so it's, it's my understanding as I read through the scriptures that the only people who have any business being terrified of God are people who are unwilling to submit to God. Sin is what gets this all messed up for us. I want you to think about this for a second. The Bible doesn't start with sin. The Bible starts with goodness. God said it's all good. And Adam and Eve lived in the perfection of God's creation. They spent time with their creator every day. And then there's a moment where they eat from the tree of the what? The knowledge of good and evil. And then God comes to spend time with them that day. And they're hiding. And he says, Adam, why were you hiding? And Adam says, because I was afraid. It's the first time we see it. The sin made them afraid to be in the presence of God. And so we have to understand the fear of the Lord. Now, I want you to think of it like this. I want you to imagine that you are on an airplane, you're heading along, and all of a sudden the pilot comes over and says, folks, the plane's going down. So at that moment, you have one of three options. You either go down with the plane, you jump off the plane without a parachute on, Or you jump off the plane with a parachute on. In that moment, fear is going to be your friend. 
Because fear is going to tell you, you need to get off this plane and you need to grab a parachute before you jump. So fear is actually going to lead you to wisdom. Because you're, you're going to say, okay, it's actually the wise thing for me to do to put on a parachute. If you just said, no, you know what? I want to finish my movie. I'm going to put my headphones back in. That's not wisdom. And so fear is going to lead you to a place of wisdom. You're going to jump and you're going to have the parachute like you should. We all find ourselves actually in a very similar circumstance. See, we live in a fallen world, in fallen bodies that have been marred by sin. We have an evil one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We, all, we are all, whether we like it or not, headed to a moment where we will breathe our last breath, and then will come the judgment. And so we all know that actually we are in a very similar situation. And so what wisdom would do is it would choose us, or it would, it would lead us to choose to say, God, I want to know you and I want to know your ways so that I can, I can land safely in your providence and in your grace. God, I want to be found in you. And so the fear of the Lord is going to lead us to live by the wisdom of God. See, I want you to see how God says it to his own people, the Israelites, after he'd delivered them from Egypt and he's forming them into a nation. These are the words that he gave them as guidance for how to live their lives. Deuteronomy 10 says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today. Read these last few words with me. For your own good. It's not just because God's on some power trip and he wants everyone to submit to him. He's saying, no, no, if you fear me and you love me and you serve and you obey my commandments, it will be for your own good. He's doing this for you. He's saying, I want you to live the best life you can in this fallen world. And so follow my ways for your own good. The fear of the Lord is for our own good. To obey God is for our own good. See, Jesus said, if you love him, you will do what he commands. And you'll be better for it. And so that is the understanding that we need. That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It leads us to know how to live in God's ways inside of God's world. How to live life. How to live the life that he is calling us to live. And again, this is Solomon saying this to us. This is the, the man that God gave his wisdom to, the wisest man who ever lived. So we want to lean into that. But I do need to confess something to you. Throughout this message, I've been lying to you just a little bit, and I did it just a few seconds ago. Not, not a lot, but just a little bit, but hang with me here. I need you to understand why. See, often Solomon is referred to as the wisest man who ever lived, and because the Bible tells us that. But I think if we really understand the full counsel of Scripture, what we would understand is that Solomon was the wisest man to ever live until a certain day in history, a day that we got to celebrate as a church family just a couple of weeks ago. There's a day that Jesus was born into humanity. See, we believe in the, the theology of the incarnation. What does that mean? It means that God came in human flesh, that he is fully God and fully man. That's who Jesus is. And so if he's fully man, what that means is that Jesus is the wisest man who ever walked the face of the earth. Jesus is the one who we are disciples of. We want to be disciples of Jesus and learn his wisdom. Jesus never had a foolish moment in his life. Everything he did was the definition of wisdom. Jesus is the embodiment of wisdom. Everything that Solomon talks about in Proverbs, Jesus actually lived it out. See, G Jesus, uh, he... He didn't have a moment where he had to try to seek wisdom or understand that he himself is the very definition of wisdom. I want you to see how Paul says it when he's writing to the Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, So the Jews, they request a sign. They want to see a sign. Greeks, they seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ, Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, it sounds like foolishness. But to those who are called disciples of Jesus... Both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the wisdom of God is stronger than men. So Jesus is the wisdom of God. If we're saying, well, I want to know what wisdom's like. I want to understand the fear of the Lord. I want to understand what it means to live in God's ways. Then you just need to look at Jesus and how he lived his life and the things that he said. See, Solomon wasn't perfect. Uh, He had the wisdom of God, but he also got it wrong sometimes. And Lady Wisdom, Lady Wisdom is just a, a fictional character, a poetic device that Solomon is using to help us understand wisdom. But Jesus, Jesus is real and he's perfect and he's the embodiment of wisdom and he came to show us what it looks like to live in God's ways in God's world. And so we must look to him. So do you know him? Do you know Jesus? See, this day uh, on the church calendar marks the celebration of Epiphany. It's the time where we celebrate the wise men who came to worship Jesus. Now, there's a lot I could say about these wise men. Like how we assume there's three because what the Bible says is there's three gifts that were given. But we actually don't know how many there were. More likely, there was actually like this painting, an entire band of wise men who came from the east to worship this child. And we can assume that they got their wisdom from Jewish men. Namely, people like Daniel, who came as a wise man among them and revealed to them the wisdom of the God of the universe. See, these wise men were the wisest people of their time. And what did they do with all that wisdom? Where did all that wisdom lead them? What did they conclude with all the wisdom that they had? Is that the wisest thing they could go and do was to go find this child who was called the king of the Jews and to worship him to bow before him, to bring gifts to him, and to treat him as king. So of the wisest men of that time period, the wisest people who lived in that culture at that time, if their wisdom led them to the place where they said, what we should do is go and worship Jesus, then why wouldn't it be the same for us? Why wouldn't we also seek him? So the question is, have you sought Jesus out? Do you know him? And more than that, do you worship him? Do you obey him? See, Jesus is the wisdom of God. So do you regularly seek his counsel by reading his word? You you know, in your bulletins this week, you're going to see that uh, we have this thing called the Proverbs Challenge. We would would encourage you that if you're not in God's word, why don't you try reading the book of Proverbs throughout the month of January and just see how reading the wisdom of God can impact your life and your heart. See, this is why we talk about the intentional life all the time. See, we, we talk about God time and gather time and group time and go time, uh, but that God time piece, what we mean by that is we want you to spend time with God daily. We want you to pray. We want you to walk with him But man, reading the word of God on a daily basis, even if it's just a couple verses, even if you listen to it on audio from your Bible app, doing that is going to give you access to the wisdom of God. It's one of the best ways to access his wisdom is through his word. Yeah, amen. And so we want to be reading the word of God. That's why we encourage you to do that. I want you to spend time with him daily. Because if we want to live the lives that we're called to live, well, then we we have to understand wisdom. And if we want to understand wisdom, we need to understand the fear of the Lord. And if we want to understand the fear of the Lord, then we need to understand the Lord himself. And he calls us to know him. So do you know him? Let me go back to that question I started with. If God came to you today and said, ask me for anything you want, what would you say? My hope would be that you would say, God, I want your wisdom. But more than that, my hope would be that you'd say, God, I want you. Jesus, I want you. I want to be connected to you. That the God of the universe actually came in human flesh in the form of a little child, died on a cross and rose again. Why? Because he loves you. He wants to show you his ways. He wants you to live the life that he's called you to live here in the flesh. And he wants you to be with him for all of eternity. This is God's will and God's heart for you. And so I hope you continue to come throughout this series and learn what the wisdom of God is all about. How we can be disciples of Jesus who live in the wisdom of God 
and live the lives that he has called us to live. As we move into this new year, may all of our hearts seek to love him and obey him and follow his commands. That we would be people who truly want to follow Jesus and the wisdom that he wants to give us in our lives so freely. And I want to give you a little bit of time to reflect on what you've heard in God's word today. Sometimes it's easy to listen to a message and then we jet back out into our lives and Yet I just want to give, give you a moment to let it crystallize. Let it solidify a little bit. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. So the worship team, they're going to lead us in a moment, but I just want you to take a moment to reflect. What is the Holy Spirit revealing to you today? What do you need to grab a hold of as you go back into your life this week that maybe is different than when you walked in? So what I want to do is I want to pray over us as a congregation. And then the team will lead us in a few moments of worship and reflection. So would you pray with me? Well, Lord, we do thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you came to embody wisdom for us and show us what it means to put flesh on that wisdom and to truly live it out. And so, God, we ask for your help. We are desperate for you, Lord. We're desperate for your help. Lord, reveal to each of us what we need to grab a hold of today and how we can live that out in our own lives and then help us do it. Lord, we want to be more like you. We want to be the people you've called us to be. So we ask, Lord, that you would help us understand the things you're revealing to us through your word and that we would continue to do that as we go throughout this series. So we thank you, Jesus. I pray this all in your name. Amen. Let's take some time to reflect and worship. Let's stand to our feet and sing this out. daily bread. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word is your very word. Spoken to me. Come on, lift it up. I'm desperate for you And I I'm lost without you This is the air I breathe, sing it out This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I, and I, I'm desperate for.
Church, we love you, and that's why we keep pointing you to this book. It's the height of wisdom. It's the bread of life. This is what Jesus said he would feast upon, and we want this for you. So don't miss another week of this series that we're doing here for wisdom. I just believe God's going to open our eyes to some incredible things. If you want to know more about our church, again, first step, free snacks and coffee right through there in the link. Come in and only take a few minutes. Otherwise, we got pastors and uh, elders up here to pray with you. Enjoy the rest of the day. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Christ the Rock. Take care.